love you so much. Would you come and inhabit the, our praises today as we worship you? In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. together grace and grace you show me grace you lifted my shame they draw me with love and kindness and washed whiter than snow you have redeemed and made me whole come on sing that again grace and grace
thankful people in the house this morning. Thank you, Father, for your grace that is so much bigger than anything we can imagine, for your grace that is bigger than sin. His grace is bigger than sin. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's just sing this song together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, whose love is breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory. King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down in your life. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Take 
thankful we thank you Jesus for amazing grace how sweet the sound the saved wretch like me once was lost but now I'm found blind but now Shout of praise. Hey, look at what he's done. Look at what he's done. Look at what he's done for us. Look what he's done for us. Look what he's done for us. Look what he's done. Look around you. Look at what he's done. Open up your eyes to see what he's done. Look what he's done for us. Look at what he's done for us. Look at what he's done for us. Look at what he's done for us. Jesus, open up our eyes to see. We want to see what you've done. Right now, open up our eyes to see. We don't want to be blinded by the enemy. But we really want to see what you've done. Look at what he's brought you from. Look at where you're going. Would you look at where we're going? He gave us hope for a future. He gave us hope for a future. Would you look at where you've come from and where we're going? It makes me just a little bit excited. That we once were dead, but now we're alive. We once were blind, but now we're seen. We once were lost, but now we're found. Yeah. I'm pretty excited about where we're going. Because we didn't used to have a destination, but we have one now, and it's heaven. It's heaven. Lord, we open up to you this morning. We open up everything inside of us to everything that you are. <clears throat> and 
I believe we have heaven inside of each and every one of us. And that heaven doesn't start when you die, but it starts at salvation. And when we, when we begin to open up, we actually can bring heaven into a realm, into this realm. So Lord, right now, we open up ourselves to let heaven out into this spot right now. It's always been your plan to come bring heaven through man and you haven't changed so we open up our hearts our minds our will our gates of heaven and we lift up our heads to let the king of glory in right now yeah you know what your job is to give heaven away
you to do something good, you know, and do something really well, they'd say, give them hell. And uh, I have a new philosophy. Let's give them heaven. Let's give them heaven. Let's give them everything that heaven has to give. Because it's what the world is longing for, is to see heaven inside of somebody. So today, Lord, we recognize that you put so much inside of us, and we right now open up so that the world can see Jesus, so that the world can see real beauty, so that the world can see real love. We want to give that away. We want the world to know love that never dies. We want to know love that never dies. Yeah. We want to give it away. Just send that out open. Open up the heavens, open wide, cause I want to see the beauty you hold inside, and open up I want to know the love that never dies. We have something to give. We have something to give. You know, sometimes worship is just realizing who Christ is in you. So you can give it away. So you can release it to your family. 
Release it in your homes. Release it at your job. We just want to see you, Jesus. Because I'll tell you what worship isn't. Worship isn't good theology. But it's when you see Jesus and can't help but sing about his faith. Because your theology really doesn't matter once you meet Jesus. What you think about him doesn't matter once he's in the room. All that matters is that he's in the room. All that matters is that he's here in front of you. What you think about him doesn't matter at that point. All that matters is he's here. It only matters that you're here. Yeah, you just come on. And in the beginning. You were singing, and in the end you'll still be singing over me. And in this moment, you're right beside me. You're everywhere, you're in the air that I breathe. You are an endless ocean, a bottomless sea. Cause you are an endless ocean, a bottomless sea. And we want to drink. Cause you are an a bottomless sea. Come on, in my sin, in my sin, you kept loving. There's no end to your forgiveness and mercy. Every morning, you keep coming. The waves of your affection, they keep washing over me. Yeah, cause you are, cause you are me, me so sharp. A bottomless sea. Yes, yes, come on, sing it out. You are an endless ocean, wash over me. A bottomless sea, wash over me, wash over me. You are an endless ocean, a bottomless angels and all those angels they are swimming in this ocean and they still can find no shore day and night and night and day You have me. Come on and 
Take a dream, take a dream. Oh, there's no end to the affection. You have for me. Is anybody thankful? Is anybody thankful? There's no end to the affection. This you have for me. You're a bottomless sea. You never run out. You never run dry. Cause you are an endless ocean. Sailor was born. When she was born, uh, and she came into being, all I saw was absolute perfection. And uh, she didn't do anything to deserve my love yet. She hadn't uh, done anything for me. <laughs> she didn't give me anything. In fact, all I've ever done and all I ever will do is give to her. She couldn't give me anything in return because all she had to give was her breath. And you know what? That was enough for me. So when she came to the, to the world, I saw perfection. And if that's the way I feel as a father who, who's trying to, his best to be a good father, how much more does our heavenly father feel about us? When you came into being, he saw perfection. And there is no end to the vastness of his affection and love for you. He's not going to love you any more when you do better. He's not going to love you any less when you do worse. You're just loved the way you are 100% of the time. 
not dependent upon how well you perform, not dependent on how much you can sin or not sin, but dependent on who you are and that you were created by a Father who loves you. I don't know about you, if there's any fathers in the rooms, but my daughter, because I'm doing everything I can emulate my Father in heaven, no matter what she does, she could turn her back on me 10 years from now, 20 years from now. She could say she hates me. It don't matter. My love is not predicated upon her love for me. My love is predicated on everything that it was when I first saw her come into this world. So I just want to encourage you today that the love of God is so real and it's not predicated upon your performance. It's just based upon you being here on the earth. Is anybody thankful for that? Yeah. That you have for me. If there's no end to the affection that you have for me, no, no. If there's no end to the affection that you have for me, because you are. living water flowing out of us and as we come together we fill the room the spirit of God coming out of each one of us fills the room and we become that ocean and we will flow out and we can flow out to others as we go out the doors this afternoon to pour out our oceans the oceans of God onto others and flood them flood them with love flood them with light flood them with life in the name of Jesus very important very important that you allow the Holy Spirit room in your life it's very important we don't ever want to have a form of godliness and deny the power it's one of the warnings to the churches in the book of Revelation that in the end times people would and I'm going to put it in my translation people would come to church on Sunday morning and be religious go through forms of religion but deny the power in other words do not give room for the power and the presence of God 
You know, this morning, there's going to be people whose lives will literally be changed. They will remember this morning. There are people in this room right now, under the sound of my voice, watching on the webcast. And they will be healed by the power of God. Just, God will just come down and heal you right during this service. There will be people in this room that at the end of the message today, or maybe even during the message, the Holy Spirit will convict your heart and you'll repent of your sins and you'll make things right with God and you'll remember this day Just like I can remember when I was 16 years old, it was my birthday on a Sunday. I was sitting on the back row, passing notes back and forth with the other teenagers. Back then, you know, know, today they text each other during service. Back then we wrote notes. (laughs) Wasn't paying any attention to my dad's sermon that morning. But at the end of the sermon, the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of my heart and I was the only one that came up into the altar to get saved on my 16th birthday. Can you imagine? My dad was preaching and I'm the only one to get saved. And he and I knelt and cried at the altar for 30, 40 minutes. Nobody left the room. Everybody sat there and waited reverently as I really sold out my life to God my 16th birthday see today somebody's going to have an an encounter with God just like that somebody's going to have an encounter today where the Holy Spirit heals you deep wounds that you've had in the past somebody today is going to have depression or oppression just it'll just leave it'll just leave and you'll go wow do I feel better I don't know if today's your day but you could choose to make today your day you can actually choose you can say God don't pass me by (laughs) how many kind of get that feeling say Lord, I'll take whatever you're passing out today. (laughs) Come on, send the angels over this way with whatever gifts they got. I'll take it. I'm looking across our our audience this morning, and and I'm seeing Sister Govier back there that's been very, 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 very sick, and I'm so proud of her for coming today. A couple of you go and stand with her. She's standing up. She wants prayer. Glory to God. Let's, let's reach out to her, and um, I don't see Teresa or Amy here this morning, but Teresa's uh, son, Rob, went home to be with the Lord. Some of you know Teresa was a, um, uh, one of our greeters out there before her son got so ill, and she's literally left her job, everything, been taking care of him for over a year now. And Amy always runs camera two back here on Wednesday nights and works in our media department. So we want to remember them. Um, We're going to have a service for them Wednesday night right before church. So at 6 o'clock, we'll have a memorial service on Wednesday night. And then Elsie's over here. A couple of you get around to Elsie. And uh, I don't see any of the other family, Bridget or any of the others, but... Elsie's daddy went home to be with the Lord after a long, long, long illness. And uh, Monday night will be a viewing. Tuesday we'll have a service right here about 4 o'clock. You can call the church for all the details, but we want to just love on her. Um, Dennis and Georgia's son, Darren, battling for his life. So a couple of you get around them and pray for them. And uh, Rebecca and Farrah are with us. Just literally got out of the hospital, came to church today. We want a couple of you get around them. Raise your hand there, Rebecca and Farrah. A couple of you get around them and pray for them. And uh, 
there's several others. I'm looking around. There's a lot of people in the room that have had some real difficult times. And if you want somebody to just agree with you in prayer, would you just raise your hand right now? And anybody around them, one back there, anybody around them, just put your hand on their shoulder right over here. Just get around them. I want Nate and Deborah to grab this microphone right over there. I'm going to put these prayer requests in your hands. We haven't said a lot about it, but Nate and Deborah have taken over the 8 o'clock service. So anytime any of you have to leave out of town early or something, or you got a family function or something, you can come to the 8 o'clock service, and Nate and Deborah are there. They have a whole team, multiple speakers, multiple leaders. So proud of them. And here, Nate, I'll, give, I'll put the church requests in your hand. Deborah, I'll put the webcast requests in your hand. And you two just pray. And all of us, let's pray for our church family. Listen, listen to this. We have Christina, Kathy, Terry, George, Mary, uh, Michael, Manila is here, uh, standing in for her daughter Kathy and her husband uh, uh, Troy and uh, Joan. We have Ivan, Raymond, Jotty, Ahmad, Bill, Jari, Jason, uh, Raymond, Jonathan, and Michael, all military out of our church. And they're in Afghanistan, Japan, Maryland, Germany, uh, out in the Middle East, military police. I mean, we've got a, a boatload of needs right here. Amen. <laughs> so stretch your hands out towards those around you. Go ahead. You two just pray and release that anointing right now. Our Father, we stand in, in awe and listening to the pastor and the prayer requests and the needs of the people. We, we stand in, in this moment of, ah, oh, Heavenly Father, help us. But we, we, we stand in, in, in a firm ground because he died on that cross for our sins and our transgressions. And we know <clears throat> that it's not going to be an easy road. We know we're going to go through some things. But we know he's there with us through it all. So we, we, we reach for your hand, Father. Asking, Father, to comfort us that you will. We, we ask, Father, to look upon these, I won't call them burdens, but these trials that we go through. In that standing, we, we, we know, Father, that you're with us. But we, we just ask that you yes. comfort us this time, Father. Bring comfort, strength. To us, strength. Jesus. Father, we just, all in all, we, we keep on walking in your light because we know your light. We know that that light that you shed upon us yes. was a healing light. Yes. We take that yes. healing right now, Father. Jesus. Illuminated us with it yes. as your light flow through us. Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Lord, we just praise you and thank you for answering our prayers, Lord. We thank you for the affection and the love that you have for each one of us. So as we hold these requests before you, we know that they do not go unnoticed. And they do not go un unanswered, Lord. But we know that your mighty will and your mighty power will meet each need in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. D does anybody feel anything different in the atmosphere this morning? It's... It's like um, it's like you better fasten your safety belt uh, around here. Hallelujah. Give our worship team a big God bless you. 
Hey, worship team, uh, don't go too far. Come on down front here. Uh, Jordan and Ruthie, why don't you come down here? And um, Jordan, you got one of your CDs with you there, Ruthie? You got one back there, David? Yeah. Um, worship team, come on, you help me. And we're going to lay hands on uh, Jordan and Ruthie here. Jordan's new CD just came out this week. Amen. Any of the worship team that are in the audience here, why don't you come up around behind us here? Alexis, come on. Linda, come on. Any of the other worship team out there? Come on. And, um, and just hold that. Uh, here, you, you guys hold it out like that. Some of you elders that are just close by, reach out towards them. And uh, we just want to bless them. And after service today, you can go and pick one up and, uh, and bless them. Father, we just thank you for the gift that you've given this house in Jordan and Ruthie and Selah and little baby to be. We just, we bless them today. Lord, I was just thinking while Jordan was leading today, you, you've blessed us with a gift and, and uh, thank you for healing Ruthie, Lord. She's yes. just uh, been very, very ill, but we just pray she'll get back on that paintbrush and and start painting for us again and and um, Lord we just thank you for this album it's going to touch people's lives some of the music we even sing here in in the services and Lord we just bless them right now I, I pray that people will go online and download and purchase and and I pray that their lives will be affected I know uh, birthing an album like this is like birthing a baby. It's been a long time, but you have provided all the funds, all the resources, and now here it is. So you market it, Lord. You get it out there. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Give them a big God bless you. Hallelujah. Really proud of them. That's um, that's a big deal. <laughs> that's a uh, Jordan deal. That's a big deal to uh, to cut an album like that and and pull all that together. It's a it's it's even in many ways more complicated than writing a book. And uh, we just are so proud of them. I was looking all around for Glendora. Is she here? Is she here this morning? Uh, I wanted to. Say something to her. We'll catch her the next time around. Amen. I just want to tell you, I'm so just, can I say stinking proud? Is that, is that Polk County redneck when I just say I'm so stinking proud of you? I, it doesn't make any sense that you'd say stinking proud, but that's, that's how I am. Just really proud of you. Uh, Saturday, uh, the, the God Day people came in for the shoes for kids campaign with all the boxes that we have and and um, that pod out in front of the the church is probably over one-third filled almost half filled with shoes and to the best of our knowledge they went through they counted them you have given over 1,125 pairs of shoes isn't that awesome and uh, if I'm not mistaken, if I understood what she said, we are either number two or number three in all of Central Florida for shoes collected by a single organization. And uh, I'm just really proud of you. That is awesome. And uh, yesterday they, they picked up another 75 pairs of shoes or whatever. Uh, they did an all-day thing where they stood out on the street corners and waved people in with the shoes and different things and um, uh, it, it, it's just been a really good thing so uh, you've got the rest of June now to bring in any shoes and and so forth and uh, just really really proud of you uh, the ushers are passing the attendance sheets right now uh, please sign those attendance sheets at least once a week and any guests that are here the red and white side is for you uh, home folks, or if you have signed the sheet before, use the black and white side. Thank you very, very much. Uh, the ushers are coming to receive the morning tithes and offerings. 
And um, I, I hesitate talking a lot about the offering because I know a number of you have been in situations in the past where maybe you were in a church that abused the offerings or so forth. Uh, I know some of you have been in situations where uh, you've even had negative teaching about uh, offerings. There's even churches here in our town that don't even take offerings. They put a box on the back wall and just say, anybody who wants to can give. Uh, can I just tell you, I love those people, but they were wrong and are wrong. <laughs> You know, now, if God's told them to do it, that's fine. But if they're teaching it as Bible, that's not right. If they're teaching it that that's what God's instructed them to do, that's okay. But it's not what God instructed us to do. God instructed us, he said, when you come, you bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in the house of God. Your tithe belongs here. Then as you're blessed, over and above your tithes, you give offerings and you should not ever be felt compelled to give in other words nobody should ever twist your arm to give that's not right it's right there in the bible it's plain you can read it it's in black and white god loves a cheerful prompt to do giver someone that loves to give just gives out of a heart of god's bless me i want to be a blessing Amen. that's the way we should always give and we should never give grudgingly or out of necessity. You know, my dad used to teach. He said, it's okay, you don't have to tithe. There's a curse on you if you don't tithe, but you don't have to tithe. And people didn't understand what he was saying because they thought, well, that's Old Testament that there's a curse on you if you don't. No, do you understand that Satan is a thief? It's his job description to kill you to destroy you, to take you out. In other words, life on this planet is designed to cause you trouble and take you out. But if you place yourself under the shadow of the Most High God, the Bible says, Psalm 91, He will protect you and He will keep you. And one of the scriptures that ties in with that is Malachi 3 that if you and I will put God first by giving him the first fruits of our life, which the example is the 10%, that's just the first part. 10% is the minimum. That God blesses you, protects you, and the Bible says that God gets in the devil's face for you personally. He doesn't just send an angel. God tells the devil to back off. Well, I can't afford to tie. You can't afford not to. That's what the Bible is trying to tell you is that when you tithe, God will get in the devil's face and rebuke him. And God will take the 90% that you have and he will expand it. He will blow it up and, and take care of so much for you sickness and trouble and accidents and all kinds of things God will protect you that's what my dad was saying when he says that you don't have to tithe but you're under a curse and what was he talking about he was talking about the curse of uh, that's on this earth because the devil's here but if you're doing what God wants you to do you're under a blessing that's why the Apostle Paul, when he was teaching the Corinthian church and he was teaching the church at Ephesus how to give because they really didn't know how to give. They were unchurched. They were off the streets. They had never been in church. They didn't know how to give. And he was teaching them. He says, look, I'm not, I'm not up here trying to get an offering from you people. He said, I am eager for the blessing that's going to come to you because you've given. And he's, he's like exasperated. Is that a word? He's like, I'm trying to help you. Yes. It, it, I was using a little Polk County talk there. Trying to help you. <laughs> because 
when you give, the Bible's black and white on this. When you give, it's going to be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Will men pour into your bosom, the Bible says. And what is that talking about? That means you're going to be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. You, everything you, you do, God's going to bless the works of your hands. You, you're going to get raises in pay. You're going to get contracts. You're going to get deals. You, every store you go to is going to be a blue light special. I mean... Can I just tell you, yesterday, I needed a new little laundry bag. My, my little dry cleaning bag had ripped, and I said, where can I go to get one of those things? And I'm just thinking and racking my brains, and I don't know where to go, and who's going to have a laundry bag? You know, I, I was thinking, well, maybe Walmart or Target. You know, Target. I, I didn't know where to go, and um, I was pumping some gas and this goofy little lady with a funny hat and all these buttons all over her and a flak jacket and everything that works there at Sam's she just is wandering around has these giant sunglasses I mean these things are like giant and she's walking around how are you today sir and I said I'm fine I'm fine I said you know I was looking for a little dry cleaning bag and and I showed it to her because I had it right there in the back seat of my car I said do you have any idea where to go she says Oh, honey, I know right where to go. You go over there, that TJ Maxx, and they got one of them things. And I'm thinking, how weird is this? I walked right into TJ Maxx, and I go back there, and I'm expecting, seriously, I'm expecting to pay 10 bucks for the thing. You know, that's what I'm thinking. On sale, $2. $2. put a goofy little lady with a hat. Oh, I hope she's not here. I mean, what are the odds? What are the odds of that happening? For all I know, she was an angel in disguise. I have no, I, oh, was that you? No, I'm just, have an angel in disguise. Do you understand God loves you? He really does. He cares about your stupid little dry cleaning bag that you need. So you don't waste time running from store to store to store to store looking for it. He cares about you. Amen? Amen. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, I'm God's favorite. <laughs> how, many, how many feel like you're God's favorite? He's so big, he can do that. Amen? Ushers, come, receive the morning tithes and offerings. Lord, we just bless your people. I just pray right now for those people that have really been struggling in their finances. Help them to realize that God wants to bless them. All they have to do is trust him with their life. And this is one of the best ways to learn how to trust is to trust you with our finances. And we're putting it in your hands and watching you bless us. Thank you, Lord God, that this house is blessed. Thank you, Lord God, that this congregation takes care of me and the other staff members were blessed. Thank you, Lord God, for the business people and professionals that you have just blessed in this house. And Lord, thank you to the best of my knowledge. I don't think as of today, I don't know of one person in our congregation that needs a job. That Everybody's got a job. But Lord, I know some of them need a better job and an increase of income. And so right now in the name of Jesus, I release that in Jesus' name, jobs and better jobs, raises in pay, promotions, better contracts, better deals, housing situations, transportation issues, in Jesus' name. Thank you for it, Lord. Bless your name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Uh, who's doing announcements? Are you doing announcements? Thank you, Miss Deborah. How many appreciate this lady? Hallelujah. Amen. Ignited webcast audience, do you know that there is no end 
to the affection that God has for you. That means never ending love. Amazing. And he lavishes it upon us. Oh, amazing. Ruth Schofield was here Thursday morning, and I heard she had a powerful message, but not to worry because you can hear her Tuesday at 10 o'clock right here in the prayer chapel. And also you can hear her Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. You know, she is our prayer warrior that's in Washington, D.C., and she leads, leads a lot of the prayer meetings there. She's a powerful intercessor. So come on out and learn from her and also learn strategies in which you can pray and you can see things done. Saturday, June 29th, from 10 in the morning till 3, there'll be the healing rooms training. And if you, yes, they're waving to me. These are some of the leaders over here of the healing room. And if you want to become part of the team and become a healing technician, or if you just want to know what it's all about, please come out Saturday morning at 10 o'clock and you can learn how to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. Amen. Here are two of our leaders, Rhonda. Yeah, Mark, his name just flew out of my mind, but Rhonda and Mark Boyer. They're part of our leading team. Next Sunday at 6 o'clock, Night for Israel. That's on the 30th. An evening of solidarity and celebration with Christian and Jewish community. So we'll be gathering together. This is hosted by Pastor Scott Thomas. There will be no... Um, Service here, 6 o'clock, Sunday night on the 30th, and you can read it up there. But um, we'll be coming together as a community, and we're going to be celebrating, and we're going to be lifting up Israel. So come and be a part of that. That's very important to the Lord's heart. So let's gather together as one, both Christian and Jewish. Where is that going to be? At the Lakeland Center. That'll be good. As Pastor already told us about the um, shoes for kids and how our container out there is almost halfway full, well, we have until the end of June to bring in more shoes. Remember, these are shoes that have already been worn and used, shoes that you might want to discard. But don't do that. Bring them in, put them in the container because they're going to be refurbished. And there's a whole team that's working to do that, and they'll be paid. They're people who need work, and they'll be paid to refurbish these shoes. And then they'll be sent to um, places like Haiti, places where there's need for them. And, of course, they'll be, they'll be free to those people. And also, people in our community in, um, in uh, Florida, I think it's the central Florida area, will be given new shoes, the children who need them. So please, look through your closet, look through your garage, your basement, anywhere you've been placing those old shoes and bring them in. We have to the end of the month. At this time, I'd like any visitors to please raise your hand so that we can welcome you here to Ignite It. Yes, we're glad you came. The ushers are going to give you a packet, and in that packet, you'll find a little card. Please fill out the back of the card, take it to the bookstore, and you'll receive a free gift from us this morning. We're so glad you decided to come and worship the Lord with us. Also, webcast audience, we're so glad you tuned in, and I want you to know that you are deeply loved by the Lord. And we consider you a part of our family. So anytime you're in the area, come by, visit us, um, send a, us a message and let us know that we're watching. And send in your prayer request because we, we care about you just as the Lord does. Bulletins. Anyone who didn't receive a bulletin for the month of June, raise your hand and you can find out all the other things that are going on here at Ignite It. 
We have so many activities going on, it's hard to, to read them all in the announcements. So you'll find out more information in those bulletins. Well, let's stand and let's welcome back our pastor as we continue our service. Thank you, Miss Deborah. God bless you. Thank you. By the way, I didn't get a chance to tell you thank you for all of the birthday blessings that you gave us a couple of weeks ago. Thank you very, very, very much. Appreciate that. Um, I plan to go out and get a new suit uh, with that, and uh, I just haven't had time to go. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're going to do that. Uh, want to um, emphasize the healing room training. Even if you do not plan to work as a healing technician, I'd like for you to go through the training because you will learn how to pray for the sick. And that's... There are two things that we need everybody who calls this their church home. These are two classes everybody needs to take. One is the healing room training, and the other is how to minister around the altars. And tonight, 6 o'clock, you'll meet in here. Uh, we'll have a service, and then we're going to release you into the chapel. Those of you that have not had altar workers training, if you've had part one, tonight I think is going to be part two. And even if you've not had part one, come tonight, get part two, and then uh, uh, the next week you can, or two weeks from now, you can get part one. They'll just keep that going for the next several weeks until everybody in our church has had that training. So please, those are the two classes. Those are your assignment. If this is your church home, if you've not had either of those classes, take them, please. And then Sunday night, I'm really excited about this. This is an opportunity for all of us to get together. Everybody, let's go to the Lakeland Center, 6 o'clock. Uh, when you arrive there, uh, you, they'll have signs up that will show you right where to go. But we'll be in one of those side conference rooms there at the Lakeland Center right downtown. If you need directions, call the church office. We'll help you. Okay? Everybody happy? Praise God. If you're not happy, happiness is a decision. So decide to be happy. Uh, my dad, when we would go on vacations, would line us all up outside the car, and he'd spank us all, and he'd say, we are going to be a happy family. And that's sad but true. But uh, <laughs> it was good. Are you ready for God's word this morning? It was May of 1996 that Dad moved us back here to Lakeland. We had come when I was a small child and moved away when I was about two and a half years of age. Went and took a, a couple of churches and then came back here in 1966, just before my 11th birthday. And we moved into the First Assembly of God down on Main Street. You can still see that building. It's the small brick building down there on Main Street, right beside the Family Worship Center. That was our church. It seated about 700 people. When Dad uh, came, it was running just over 300. And um, within 10 years, the church had just expanded to six services on Sunday morning, or, or six services on Sunday, three in the morning, three at night. My wife and her family uh, came into the church during that time. The charismatic movement was really strong. The Jesus people and the hippies were just pouring into the church. And uh, Evangel Christian School was birthed. It started out as a little daycare and, and expanded up to all 12 grades. In 1975, we built right next door the big giant 1,700-seat auditorium. Many of you have driven down Main Street and seen the big uh, what is now Family Worship Center the big 1,700-seat auditorium. Uh, the charismatic movement began to grow and expand. Evangel Christian School blew up to uh, probably close to 800 students. Uh, during that time, the Word of Faith movement became very, very strong. Kenneth Hagin uh, was the powerhouse at that time. Dwight Thompson would come to our church every year, and, and I'd get saved. How many got saved under Dwight Thompson? I got saved every year Dwight Thompson came. And uh, WCIE was birthed. WCIE was one of the very first 
uh, all, all Christian, all uh, contemporary Christian worship stations became one of the top five radio stations in all of, of the United States. It was just a powerful, uh, powerful ministry. And uh, today, uh, how many have ever heard Joy FM, uh, the Christian radio station? Well, that was one of our stations. We ended up with about five radio stations across the country. Joy FM was one of them. And uh, it, it, it was just a powerful, powerful time. In 1985, we moved into the big, giant 10,000-seat auditorium, which is now the Carpenter's, uh, which became the Carpenter's Home Auditorium. We, we changed it from First Assembly of God to Carpenter's Home. That was the name we changed. And we, we would have huge concerts, huge events. The Happy Hunters came in, did a healing explosion there, 8,000 people. It was just incredible uh, the different things that took place. In 1986-87, we had this economic upside-down thing, almost like what we have now, but I personally am of the opinion it was worse then than it is now. Uh, high interest rates. You couldn't even uh, buy a home for less than 9, 10, 11, 12 percent or even higher interest rates. Uh, we lost the whole phosphate industry. We had, we had one member in our congregation that was, he was a millionaire three times over, and he lost everything in 90 days. It was just a horrible, horrible time. We lost Piper Aircraft. How many remember Piper Aircraft? Employed like 2,500 employees right here in Lakeland. We lost that. Two freezes in a row, uh, 86, 87. We lost the citrus industry. We lost the... Uh, the tomatoes, we lost the strawberries. It just, the economy tanked like major. In, uh, in March of 87, it was announced that Jim Baker of the PTL network had, had fallen morally. And in one week's time, we lost 1,000 members. Our church just lost 1,000 members in one week. It, it was just devastating. You walked in the next Sunday and you went, what happened? And it was just because Jim Baker had fallen and he had been a close friend of my dad's. He had helped dedicate the church. And people just got disillusioned. They got discouraged. They just left. In uh, late 1988, the prophetic movement was expanding. It was exploding. And there was this huge prophetic word over our my dad specifically and over our family and over our church and there was this prophetic warning coming that there was going to be a great great adversity and we had to be prepared for it and it was personally during that time that I received one of the greatest prophetic declarations over my life again confirming the call of my life to go into all the world and that signs and wonders and miracles would happen in my life and my ministry and in February of 1988, that's when Jimmy Swagger, the great evangelist, uh, it, it, he fell morally. And over the next three, four weeks, we lost 500 more people, just walked out the door, disillusioned with God, disillusioned with church, because Jimmy Swagger was a friend of my dad's and had also helped to dedicate the big 10,000-seat auditorium. It threw many in our community, many in our church into a confused state. You had the economy was going south, the high interest rates, unemployment, people were having to move across country to find jobs. You had this horrible scandals going on day after day. The, the comedians were having a heyday. How many even remember all of that? I mean, it was, it was just horrible what was going on. And it started a festering cancer of division within the house. And in 1989, the church split right down the middle. And in one week's time, we lost another 2,000 people just gone. My dad, all of us that were left, I mean, we lost most of the pastors. We lost all the deacon board. We lost all the choir, all the orchestra, most of the teachers in the school lost the whole radio staff except for one or two and we're sitting there i mean can you imagine the next sunday walking in and there's 
20 people sitting in this room. That's how it was in that big giant 10,000 seat auditorium. We went from 5,100 people down to 16, 1,700 people in just months. It was gone. And we're reeling. We're just, God, what in the world is going on? And you know, prophets, they come in. A lot of times I think some of them are non profit. <laughs> Prophets come in. Don't worry about a thing. It's all going to be better. Six months, they'll all come back. <laughs> they didn't come back. <laughs> Nobody came back. Now well, one or two. So here we are sitting in this 10,000-seat building. We've gone from 400 staff down to about 25 of us, 30 of us. The overhead was sinking us. We couldn't pay our bills, eighty, ninety, hundred thousand dollars a month in the red. We began a series of Monday night prayer meetings. For three years, every Monday night, the whole church came out and prayed for one hour, seven to eight o'clock. How many ever came to one of those prayer meetings? Wave your hand so people will see it. These people are the ones that, because they prayed, were still here alive and standing. We prayed for an hour every night. I'm, I remember Dad rarely would say anything. He'd come in, tell the audio guy, hit the music. And we'd play Don Potter, warfare instrumental things. And we would all march around the building, just praying in tongues and shouting and declaring, Koranda ba shandara. I mean, we would wear army fatigue sometimes. We got to where we were carrying swords around. Can you imagine a guest coming in and finding we were marching in army fatigues and swords? We didn't care. We were going to beat up the devil every which way but loose. Amen. For three years, prayed, fasted. I mean, there was a time when we fasted so much we were so skinny we had to run around in the shower just to get wet. Well, that was a little exaggeration. But... <laughs> I've never been that skinny. My dad has, but I haven't. We begin in that atmosphere. That atmosphere of just in the newspapers every day. People saying the most wicked and vile things about my dad and our family. Called my mother a witch? Called our church just going off into heresies? And assemblies of God was trying to kick us out? We were going, what? You just woke up in the morning and you realized you, a tornado had just come through and ripped your life apart. And that was the setting. That's where we were. We were trying to survive. Every day getting up, do we even have a job? Do we have a church? Is anybody even going to be there Sunday morning? And we were praying, God send revival. God send revival. Open the windows of heaven. Pour out a blessing. We'll not have room enough to contain it. God, you're a God of promise. You're, you didn't have us here just to exist. And we started hearing the sounds about this South African evangelist, Rodney Howard Brown. Started hearing about it. And we heard about these ways of revival that were going into every little burrow and nook and cranny of Alaska. Like, Alaska? Like, can anything good come out of Alaska? North Dakota. We heard about this little group of men that had gathered for a men's retreat at Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Can you imagine the Assemblies of God has a retreat called Devil's Lake? I just think that's so funny. I just, Assemblies of God, Devil's Lake retreat. I just think that's hilarious. And the men came to this retreat, and they brought this little evangelist in, 33 years of age. He just, and the thing blew up. And over the weekend, 
Men were filled with the Holy Ghost. They didn't even want to go home. They just stayed in God's presence 8, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. And that revival then swept across the Dakotas. And then somehow he hooked up with a little pastor down in just North Miami area, I think his homestead area, something like that. Where, where did Hurricane Andrew hit? What, was it homestead? Yeah, he was right there. And, and, and it blew up. The, the revival blew up. And, and, and winds of revival just, uh, right as the hurricane began to hit, they were in a tent. And people would fall out on the floor or out on the ground in this outdoor tent. And they had to, they had to cover the floor of the tent with hay. And people would fall under the power as the rain would wash underneath their bodies as it would wash through the tent. And they kept on going. And they were right on the outskirts of Hurricane Andrew as it blew in. We were hearing these sounds. My dad was still real popular in the nation, and, and uh, he was being interviewed on TBN. He'd flown out to uh, Dallas or someplace, and he was on the TBN show, and, and uh, they were interviewing him, and he was talking about revival and how that we'd been praying for three years for revival. And, and they said, what? What does the revival look like? And he says, it kind of looks like that young preacher we've been hearing about, Rodney Howard Brown. And, and, and he starts talking about Rodney. Starts talking about the meetings. It was 2 a.m. when the show was replayed. And Rodney had just finished a meeting up in Portland or someplace. And he was flicking through the channels. Just happened to catch TBN at 2 in the morning. Sees my dad talking about him. So he calls the friend down in, in Homestead, Miami area, and he says, Hey, do you know Carl Strader? He says, Yeah, he's a, he's a friend of mine. He says, Well, he's talking about me on TBN. Can you hook us up? January, February, I can't remember when. I remember the day I, I was in charge of the radio and the television and, the, and the, the ushers and the building and different things. And I was working up on the stage and I was working on some lights and setting up some sound stuff. And here comes Rodney and his family. They came in and my dad introduced me to him. And I thought, oh, that's nice. He's a nice guy, you know. Shook his hand and God bless you. And about two weeks later, my dad tells a group of us, he said, I want you to go to Spring Hill, Florida and investigate this Rodney Howard Brown. See if this is really what we want in our church. And me and Diana Mallory and several others went. Who else went with me to Spring Hill? Brad, you went. Who else went? There was about a, probably a dozen of us went. And they had saved seats for us on the front row. We got there about 15 minutes late. The safe seats for us. The building was jam-packed, standing room only, people in, in overflow rooms, and the place was vibrating. We ended up going back to that thing uh, three, four, five nights just as the power of God would just hammer us. It, 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 we had never felt anything like this, never seen anything like this. Not with this intensity. One night in particular, I was sitting over on the left side, front row, and and he just said, all the children that want the power of God, come up here now. And two dozen children just went across the front, and as they walked up into the altar area, they would fall over under the power of God. Oftentimes, nobody even touching them or praying for them. They would just fall into the presence of God. And I remembered the little girl, probably 10, 11 years of age, fell right at my feet. And I actually had to pull my feet up under the front pew as she fell right there. And we sat there as the glory of God shook her little body. And she was laughing and crying under the power of God. And we would feel the glory coming off of her body, hammering us. And we'd come home and we'd tell the congregation on Sunday morning, this is real, this is awesome. And then my dad gets up and announced, March 1993, Rodney Howard Brown's coming here, and we're clearing the calendar, and we're going to go two weeks. (laughs) 
16 weeks later. <laughs> Rodney Howard Brown came to our church. The glory filled the building. I was the TV director. I was up in TV control. And it, I mean, it was a TV director's dream because there was something to actually videotape. It was that people weren't sleeping. <laughs> It was exciting. It was dynamic. We, we brought in extra camera people. We, we videotaped 10 a.m., 7 p.m., night after night. We were putting it all over TBN. We were making videos that literally went around the world. An entire revival was birthed in Australia, be just people watching VHS tapes of the services. It was just incredible what took place. And one day, three... Two, three, four weeks into the revival, it suddenly hit me. If I don't get out of this control room and get down there, I'm going to miss this. So I hired another director. He came in. He took over. And I went down, and Jan and I sat. I think the first few nights we sat on the second row just so that we, we could just be in the congregation. We didn't want to be like pastors sitting on the front row. We just wanted to be in the congregation. And the glory of God began to hammer us, and, and the power of God was so strong. I remember we went into this water baptism thing. He started talking about water baptism. I'd never heard anybody talk about water baptism this way. And in the Bible, it's very plain that when you go through the waters of baptism, it was, it was just like the children of Israel going through the Red Sea. And when they came up out of the Red Sea, the waters closed in. On their whole past, the entire Egyptian army was wiped out. And it's right there in the Bible. It says that's what the waters of baptism are. When you pass through the water, old things are passed away. All things become brand new. And he was preaching this. And he says, how many want to be baptized in water? And I went, yes. And I was one of the pastors. So again, because I was in charge of things, I had to build an above-ground swimming pool right in front of the pulpit, 15-foot diameter above-ground swimming pool. Now, when you fill those things with water and you're in an air-conditioned building, that water's cold. So I searched around and I found this water heater. It was a portable water heater that looked like a cattle prod. And I put it in the side, rigged it up, put it in the side of that thing, and got that water hot. And so I'm thinking, praise God, we got the water hot. Glory to God. You know, people won't freeze. And we told everybody, wear black, because if you wear white, you know what happens when you get wet. You know, they, people would see more than they should. So we told everybody, wear black. 1,500 people lined up all the way around that big giant building. It's one-fifth of a mile. Water baptism took three and a half, four hours that night. As we baptized five, six people at a time. We'd put them in the water. Rodney would stand up here on the platform. Here is the swimming pool right there. And he'd go, filled! And the people would fall under the power. And the ushers in the tank became fishers of men. And we had put plastic all over, the auto, all over the stage, and we literally would pick them up, throw them over the side of the pool. <laughs> Ushers would grab them by their hands like this and would drag them across the plastic, slide them like wet fish on, on a dock to dry. Just hundreds of people flopping all over the stage. Well, we, it never crossed our mind if everybody wears black, What's going to happen to the water? 50 people into the line, the water is black as coal. Black water, and nobody cared. Put me in that water. Look, all the sins are left in the water. We even had this one lady that was demon-possessed. And we had cast the devil out of her, and she wanted to get baptized. We tried to put her in the water. She wouldn't go. No! Oh! So we pulled her back out of the water. We cast more demons out. Then we put her back in the water. No. Pulled her back out of the water. We learned something that demons can't swim. <laughs> Finally, the third time we got her in the water, all the demons came out. Well, I'm 
real busy cleaning up. I got people mopping. I got wet vacs going, and, and, and I've got, I'm checking the water. It didn't matter. After about 100 people in the line, the water was cold. Because there was so much water sloshing out, we had to keep filling water in, and the water heater could not keep up with the water. So people were coming in going, oh, and it was cold. So Jan's about 500 deep in the line, and she's looking at me like, I wasn't going to get out of this. She said I had to go. So <laughs> She doesn't remember that part. But anyway, I get in line, and the two of us get down in that tank, and that water was cold. It was black. And we're standing there. And I'm thinking, okay, I got to receive. I got to take off my production hat, management hat. I got to receive. And I got in the water, and the power guide hit me, and I went under the water. And I was so overcome with the presence of God, I couldn't get out. I mean, I'm under the water. I'm trying to get, I couldn't swim, nothing. It's three feet of water. I couldn't get out. I was like a jellyfish. And suddenly I became aware that I was being electrocuted. And my brain kicks in. My brain kicks in. The water heater has short-circuited. And everybody in the water is getting electrocuted. We're all going to die here in the water. Get me out of the water. And I'm trying to get up and I'm trying to tell everybody, unplug the water heater, unplug the water heater. And then I realized, that ain't a water heater, you idiot. It's God. So they pull me up out of the water, and I'm flopping all around, and I'm flopping on the stage. Pastor Jan just, oh, she was out of order. You can't believe what she was doing. I was smacking the stage so hard that my hands were bruised. I was trying to get that electricity out of me, but it was the power of God. We went eight weeks, took a few weeks off, went two more weeks, took a month off, a couple more weeks. Every time we'd take off, Rodney would go somewhere and preach. He went to Oral Roberts University. I'm sitting on the front row at Oral Roberts University, the place where I was trained in television and media, I had told the TV crew, I said, this is what's going to happen. This is what you need to be ready for. We took all 4,000 students. We went out in the open field behind Christ Chapel there on that big, beautiful lawn area. And Rodney Howard Brown would go down the line, field, 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 field. 4,000 students in administration scattered all over that field. I remember the grass was a little thick. They hadn't mowed it yet, and, and grasshoppers were shooting everywhere, and, and Rodney was going, Phew! <laughs> Oral Roberts thought that was so funny that Rodney swallowed a grasshopper. And Rodney had a... a, a scripture verse for everything that happened and he just turned to Oral and said he was a stranger and I took him in. (laughs) Totally turned Oral Roberts University upside down. Richard Roberts was a blithering mess. Hair standing up. I mean it was just, it was chaos. Then we came back, did some more revivals at Carpenters and then we went to Raymond. Rodney went out there to Raymond. It was just total chaos as the power of God just swept through the place. In January of 1994, Rodney did a whole month of meetings. Started on New Year's Eve, went all the way through the entire month of January. One of the weeks he called it his winter camp meeting and ministers flew in from all over the world. Marilyn Hickey and Wally were sitting on the front row. Uh, Richard Roberts on the front row. Just you name the who's who in the charismatic zoo. They were there. Everybody in the first couple of rows. It was a powerful, powerful meeting. There was a young vineyard pastor that had uh, had encountered Rodney at another meeting during some of the weeks that Rodney w- had closed at Carpenters and would go out 
and he had gone to St. Louis, and this young vineyard pastor had gotten hit by the Holy Ghost there in St. Louis. Well, we heard about this camp meeting, so he came down to Florida. His name was Randy Clark. On Friday morning, we always did an anointing service, five, six, seven, sometimes 8,000 people. And Rodney promised everybody that would come on Friday morning, they'd get hands laid on them. And we would line them up, up and down through the place. That's why Brad and I look so good now is because we lined up a whole lot of people, didn't we, Brad? I mean, every day, sometimes twice a day, thousands of people. We would line them up and Rodney would go, filled, filled, filled. But we had a rule. No double dipping. Because some people would fall into the power and run around getting the line. That made the line longer. So we had a rule. Randy Clark ignored that rule. He got in the line once, twice, three times. Rodney caught on to the fact that Randy was getting in the line multiple times. Now, we didn't know who he was, had no clue who he was. There was 10,000 people a day coming. There was no way. You just didn't know who people were. And, and he laid hands on him. He says, now, don't get up. And sure enough, here come Randy. He'd get back in the line. Eight times Randy got in the line that Friday morning. Gets on an airplane, flies to Toronto, and on Sunday morning starts the Toronto blessing. That's how that happened. February 1994, Rodney left on a a nationwide tour, and he had walked up to me and Jan at the the garlic garden down the road here, and he says, come with me. And what did I say? The garlic garden? Yeah, that's what I called it, right? Olive garden. And, and he says, come, follow me. We left everything. Took, at that time, we had three kids, and we piled into our car and pulled a little horse trailer kind of thing, and we ended up on the road with Rodney for the next six months, seven months. Every day in that anointing, every day washed and, and, and smothered and immersed in that anointing. It was incredible. 1995, we returned to Carpenter's Home Church. Jan was pregnant with Alexis, but I continued to travel on my own. In June of 1995, John Kilpatrick and Steve Hill had been watching the revivals. They'd been watching the videos. They'd been watching TBN. They'd been listening, and they were hungry for revival, but they didn't like what was happening in Lakeland. But they wanted revival, and they were crying out for it. And you know the story. Steve Hill comes to, to uh, Brownsville, Pensacola on that Father's Day in, in June of 1995. And the glory hits. And the Pensacola revival is born. Steve Hill and John Kilpatrick just blew up literally all over the world. Roy Fields was touched in those meetings. And Roy Fields would later come to ignited and be part of the 19 or the 2008 outpouring. California with Bill Johnson and Cheon and Lou Engel, all of those guys got hit in the Toronto blessing. Heidi Baker, so many more got hit in the Toronto blessing. It spread to Europe, it's it spread to Latin America. Claudia Frizon was was hit by the power of God, came here to to, to, to the U.S. to get prayed for by Benny Hinn. He would have been touched by the Good Morning Holy Spirit book. And Rodney happened to be in that meeting as a guest with Benny. And Benny calls him out and says, Rodney, he needs your anointing for Latin America. Rodney came up and prayed for Claudio, who didn't speak English at the time, never knew it was Rodney that had prayed for him. Goes back and it blows up. In all of Argentina, revivals just hit, and it just smashed the entire Assemblies of God in Argentina. It hit the Pentecostal Evangel. It hit the home missions uh, or the, the missions magazines. And there it was, right out of Little Lakeland, Toronto, Pensacola, Argentina, Europe, all of Europe, all of Scandinavia, was all touched by the power of God all over Australia, New Zealand. There was a young pastor, 
down near the Kansas City area, Steve and Kathy Gray had a little tiny church. I'm talking about a hundred people church out in the cornfields in Smithton, Missouri. Two hours from even a hotel or a restaurant. One traffic light in the city. And they invited a, a young evangelist by the name of Frank Seamster to come in with them. And that revival blew up and they moved the whole, the whole church. Can you imagine? The whole entire church moved to Kansas City. And it's one of the few revivals that is still going on today. They go Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Still going today. And Frank Seamster is part of our church here now. The healing rooms with Cal Pierce. Cal Pierce was a deacon in, in, in Bill Johnson's church in Redding, California. He got hit by the anointing that came from Toronto, that came from Lakeland. Cal Pierce went up north into Spokane, Washington, started the healing rooms ministry, and now our church is one of the healing rooms of that ministry. Came full circle. Most of the revivals faded after three to five years. But Redding, California with Bill Johnson, still going on today, primarily through their school and, and their conferences, their school of supernatural ministry, which we have here in, in Lakeland now, the, the Jesus culture movement, schools of the supernatural, all came out of the revivals of the 90s. I was traveling personally to Central America, Costa Rica, all, all through it, Panama, all throughout Central America, I was going to the Philippines, to India, to Africa. I was starting fires wherever I went. It was actually prophesied that I was a Holy Ghost arsonist. Just starting fires everywhere, fanning the flames of revival. I came home and just traveled part-time around 2000-ish, 2001, 2. I started spending more time here at the church until we started Ignited Church in 2005. I'm telling you this. Because so many of you are new to the church and don't know what this church was birthed in. You think Ignited Church sounds like a cool name, but there's a, there's a history behind it. A price has been paid for us even to be in existence today. These series of revivals were steeped in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. As a matter of fact, the first few years of our very existence of Ignited Church, I think that's all I preached was Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. I actually got up one time and preached a different verse. My, oh, I came home and my wife and my kids said, thank you, Dad, for preaching something different. Because <laughs> they'd listen to me six days a week when we were traveling, preaching the same sermons. Because that's the message God had given me. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8 it says, You will receive power. Dunamis power. Acts chapter 2. These are not drunk as you suppose. How do you suppose they suppose they were drunk? Because what was happening looked like they were drunk. It was total chaos. While Rodney would be preaching, you... People would be laughing and crying and shouting and falling. I remember the, one of those first few weeks that Jan and I, I had come out of the control room and I was sitting down front and there was a lady right behind us, probably 20-something, and she was laughing right in my ear. Now, it's one thing watching it on the TV cameras up in the control room. It's another thing to be sitting there in the audience with six, eight, ten thousand people all laughing at full volume, and you're sitting there and you're experiencing this. And she's sitting right behind me, and I did what every good pastor would do. Try. You know, I was trying to hear the word. I wanted the word. We need the word. I had my notes out, my yellow pad. I'm taking notes. You know, I gave her that evil eye. She thought that was even more funny. <laughs> I'm trying to hear what the preacher is saying, and these people are laughing uncontrollably. Well, the short version is that lady kept laughing. She laughed through the altar call. She laughed after everybody was gone. In those days, we had 24-hour security, and security guards had to help her to get out to her car. We have, you know, five acres of parking lot. 
She, she couldn't find her car. She's looking everywhere. And finally, they just pushed her out in the parking lot in a wheelchair and said, lady, just b- pick a car. Just pick a car. <laughs> she finally finds her car. She's too drunk to drive. She's sitting in her car, hitting the steering wheel, laughing uncontrollably. The, the security made sure her doors were locked and just left her. About 30 minutes later, she sobered up enough to drive to Tampa. How many have heard this story? Some of you have heard this story. She drives to Tampa. That was a Tuesday night. Wednesday night, we told everybody, go honor your own church. If you have church on Wednesday night, go honor your church. Well, she was in a church in Tampa that had a dry cleaning service on Wednesday nights. You know, in by 7, out by 8. Well, we were live on the radio, so she gets into her car in Tampa, Florida, turns on WCIE right at 8 o'clock. Rodney's just getting preaching, and she's hearing the laughter. She's hearing the sounds of revival. And she's driving on Interstate 4, and she starts getting drunk in the spirit. She starts weaving all over those eight lanes of traffic. And you know those, those guys in the brown uniform, they don't like that. Florida Highway Patrol pulls her over, big six-foot-five. <laughs> Highway Patrolman gets out of his car, comes up there. You know, he got 60 pounds of equipment all around him, you know, the flashlight, the gun, the taser, everything. He comes over there and he says, get out of that car. And she's smacking at the window, she's smacking at the wheel, she can't find no, she can't find the doorknob. She can't find the window thing. She, he says, lady, are you drunk? I'm drunk. I'm drunk. I'm drunk. Get out of that car. She can't find the handle. Finally, he opens the car door. She starts to fall out. Being a good police officer, he's going to steady her. Some of you are getting ahead of me. The moment he touches her, the power of God hits him, and he falls under the power right in on top of her. (laughs) Slides down on his knees, has his head in her lap, and she's stroking his head. It's going to be okay, sir. It's going to be okay. This is a true story. I'm not preaching right now. She's still got the car running, still has the radio on, and I remember the night Rodney's preaching, and he stops in the middle of his sermon. He says, I'm supposed to give an altar call right now. If you've been running from God, get up here now. And 400 people ran to the altars and gave their hearts to Jesus instantly, just like that. That big old highway patrolman, he is weeping uncontrollably, and that lady's just stroking his hair. It's going to be okay, sir. It's all right. He says, no, lady, you don't understand. I'm the son of a backslidden Pentecostal preacher, and I've been running from God, and I stopped to arrest you for drunk driving, but God has arrested me. I started traveling to the Philippines, found out Rodney's brother had been there before me and he had sparked some little revivals here and there and I came in, fanned the flames and it blew up all over the Philippines and I'll be going again to the Philippines in September. I've been over 30 times now as the revival fires have just smashed into the Philippines. One of the places it hit the hardest was the Catholic Charismatics and the Charismatics were hit with the power of God. They would routinely meet on Friday nights and would worship, just worship, from 6 o'clock to midnight every Friday night. I took a whole team, about 30 of us went. How, how many of you went on that team where, where we went and saw the Catholics, Charismatics? And, and we walked in there, into the room, and I had warned all the team members. I said, I'm just telling you, be ready to hang on to something, because you walk into the room, the power of God's going to hit you. And Pastor Jan was just kind of quietly listening to me, and she knows that I sometimes get excited about things, and she just didn't believe me. She got 10 feet from the door and fell out under the power on the sidewalk. We had to help her to get in. It was so strong in there. My children got hit by the power of God. It it was just amazing to watch these Catholic charismatics 
worshiping God. I got invited to the Catholic University, stood up in front of the Catholic University as the first Protestant ever to be in there. I'm standing there, and I look over, and Mary is standing beside me. A statue of Mary with little fetishes and little candles lit to her, and she's standing there, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me. And and so I tell the congregation, I said, did you know that Mary, the Blessed Virgin, knew that she had to have the power of the Holy Spirit. Even though she had been infused with the Holy Spirit to give birth to Jesus, she needed the power of the Holy Spirit in her life. How many of you want to be like Mary? And they all raised their hands, and 280 out of the 300 were instantly filled with the Holy Spirit. I got it all on video. You can see it. All filled with the Holy Spirit, just like that. Begin to speak in another tongue, shouting, laughing, crying. Then my... Pentecostal mind said, wait a minute, these people aren't saved, they're Catholic. So I led them all to Jesus, and they got the, uh, did the sinner's prayer with them, and I said, okay, now you're all saved. <laughs> you know, that's how your brain works. Our local high school, Lake Gibson High School, the principal calls our church one day, says, what's going on over there? And we said, why? And he says, he says we can't have classes here. We said, what's, what's the problem? He says, He says, people are laughing in our class. Teachers try to teach and they're laughing. He says, they all said it's happening at your church. What's going on? (laughs) Can you imagine in the local high schools? Our own school, Evangel Christian, we had to have a drunk tank. It was a room that we set aside that when a child just was overcome by the Holy Spirit, they'd just pick them up, carry them in there, let them laugh, cry, pray for hours and then come back to class it was really bad when it was the teachers (laughs) these were power encounter days that's how this church was birthed that's how this happened was in those power encounters the dunamis of god a force a miraculous power a supernatural ability and abundance of power and strength interestingly in just a few days july 1st that whole week fourth of july week rodney howard brown's coming back to lakeland for a 20-year reunion at family worship in their big new three four thousand seat auditorium i want to encourage you to go you you need to go you need to be there be part of it You can become literally clothed with the Spirit of the living God. It's not just some little emotional experience. It's certainly not a religious experience. It's something deeper. It's something more precious. In Acts chapter 2, suddenly there came a sound from heaven. The rushing of a violent tempest blast. Have you heard people describe the tornadoes? They said it's like a freight train running through your house. That's what it's like. You have this Holy Ghost freight train running through your body and it manifests in different ways. When you have such a great, magnificent God who takes up residence in your body, know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Something's going to happen. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. No. When God's power manifests in your body, your body's going to do something. Something's going to happen. The power of God's going to touch you. And you're, gonna, you're going to experience an, a sanctification, a holiness. You're just not going to desire the things of this world. You're not going to want to do something that offends the Spirit of God. You you just want to be in His presence. You return to your first love. When you're in His presence, you have fullness of joy. We don't serve God because we've made a decision. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's a great song. And that's a good beginning. 
But that's the whole problem with the church today is we've given God mental assent. We can, we can describe God. We can, we've got our theology all in order. We've, we've made all of these decisions. We, we know how to do church. The question is, is do you have a passion for God today? I know on any given Sunday morning, there's people in this room that you did not want to be here today. You came because mama made you come. There are people in this room that you've come just because it's the right thing to do. We should be in church. We need to have the family in church. Got to be in church. It's a good thing. I was raised in church. My kid's going to be raised in church. We're all going to be in church. (laughs) But there's some of you that have come to the decision, I don't care what the world thinks, I want God. I want the real, I want authentic, I don't want something that's just been stirred up by some charismatic cheerleader who says, everybody raise your hands and shout hallelujah. You want God to smack you upside the head and knock out of you anything that doesn't belong there and put in you whatever is missing. I don't think you understand. You're an ignited church. The whole purpose of the reason for this church's being is to ignite kingdom life in you. If it wasn't for the spark plugs, your engine wouldn't turn over. That's why you have spark plugs. If it wasn't for the fuel, the spark plugs would have nothing to ignite. If it wasn't for the oil that lubricates that engine, it would seize up. That's part of the problem with the church today. We got Christians that are low on oil, and they've become squeaky Christians. It's too hot in here. It's too cold in here. The music's too loud. Preacher preaches too long. There he is talking about the offering again. Squeaky Christians. You need an oil change. When you're full of God, you love it all. You love the worship. You love the announcements. You love the offering. You love the preaching. You love the pastor. When you're full of oil, you even love those weird people sitting across the aisle from you. When you're full of the Holy Spirit... You see somebody being weird in church and it doesn't bother you. You just think it's awesome. You don't care. You don't care the color of their skin. You don't care the way they're dressed. You don't care if they're old or young. Because you love everybody. The power of God's real. Is it in a game? Sit in a social club, and we ain't like any other church. That's not a prideful statement. It's just we're peculiar people. We meet here because we want God. We're not better than anybody else. We just want God. We just want his presence. When we come to church, 
we're happy that God shows up. We call this the Sunday morning worship service. Some churches, if God showed up at church, they'd all have a heart attack. We like it when God shows up. We're disappointed if he doesn't show up, aren't we? When we come to church, we want to drink. You're never too old to drink. I know what some of you are thinking. God, don't let him get anywhere near me. See, when this started happening in Acts chapter 2, the visitors at the church of the upper room said, what is going on? These people are drunk. And Peter was in training to be the first pope, stood up and he said, these people are not drunk as ye suppose. It's Sunday morning, Lakeland, Florida, Polk County. They don't drink at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. I dare you to take a drink of God's presence right now. I just dare you. I dare you to just say, God, if this is real, I want it. If this isn't real, I don't want it. Just tell the Holy Spirit right now. Just close your eyes and tell the Holy Spirit, if this is real, I want to feel your presence. I don't want to play church. I don't want to just have a religious experience. I don't want to just live my life being a religious person, I want to come to church and feel God. I want to come to church and know that God's real and that this is real. I want the real thing. You just tell God, I dare you. I double dog dare you. You boys and girls that are here, I give you permission to drink. You can have a happy meal. It's God's presence. It's real. And if you get full of God's presence, He'll take the depression away He'll take the discouragement away. You want God to send you a text message? 
He'll text you. Be careful. You'll get it. If your heart's not right with God, and maybe this scares you, I don't know, maybe you just say, man, I, don't, I'm, I hope he gives us a chance to get out of here. I want out of here quick. <clears throat> this is weird. This is just really weird. Good. <clears throat> I want you to know that God's real. This is real. His power is real. You don't have to suffer with your loneliness. You don't have to suffer with the guilt and the shame of sin. You can be set free. Free. Say, why is she laughing? Because she's happy. The Bible says, in God's Presence is fullness of joy. This can be like a Sunday morning Christmas when God gives you presents under the tree and you're so excited you can't sleep because you want to go open the presents. I know it makes you nervous when people are screaming. But wherever there's a fire, there's going to be a siren. (laughs) Say, why did that lady fall down? Because she can't sit up anymore, that's why. See, if you felt what she felt, you'd be on the floor too. It's nothing but old-time Pentecost, isn't that right? It's just old-time Pentecost. But we're so afraid of what people are going to think, what people are going to say, that we've tried to dress up and play church. I don't want to play church. I want God. I want God to invade my life. I want His power to saturate me. I want His glory to overshadow me. I don't want something that's just emotional. I want something that's real. Amen? But if your heart's not right with God, Everybody close your eyes. If your heart's not right with God, I want you to just wave at me and say, Preacher, pray for me. I want my heart right with God. Just wave at me. I'm not going to point you out. I'm just going to pray for you. Anybody else? Thank you. Good. Hands are going up. Anybody else? Just say, um, thank you. Thank you. My heart's not right with God. Let's everybody pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, come inside me. Take the bad stuff out. Put the good stuff in. Holy Spirit, I trust you with my life. Now lift up both hands. Just tell him one more time. Holy Spirit, I trust you with my life. One more time. Just take a deep breath now and let God's Spirit saturate you. Let God infuse you with a freshness, a fresh love. His fresh presence. (laughs) (laughs) If there's anybody in this room that just says, Preacher, I can't stand it another minute. I don't want to go one more minute without feeling God's presence. I've got to know that God is real. I've got to have His presence in my life. Just run up here right now and stand across the front. Just run up here real quick. Don't even hesitate. You want God's presence, run up here quick. Hurry, quickly. You want God's presence in your life. 
You want to feel his power. Run up here quick. Come on. Don't wait for somebody else. Run up here quick. Stand right up here. Lift your hands. Let the power of God go right through you. Let his power go right through you. Jesus' name. Filled with God's power. Filled with God's power. Filled with God's power. Filled with God's power. Let it go right to you. Come on, keep drinking. Filled with God's power. Just let his power go right through you. Just run up here quick. Say, preacher, I can't wait. I got to have it now. Get up here quick. Just run up here quick. Lift your hands like lightning rods up to heaven. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let his power go right through you. Lift your hands. Let God's power come right through you. Filled with God's power. Filled with God's power. Let it go right through you. Come on. Just keep drinking. Don't don't move. Just let it go right through you. Filled with God's power. Filled with God's power. Come on. Get up here quick. Run up here. Get in line. Don't walk away. Come back here. 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 Don't run away. Stay in God's presence. It's not about falling. It's about receiving. Lift your hands. As you do, God's power comes on you. Now stay right there. In Jesus' name. Fire! In Jesus' name. Fire! In Jesus' name. Let his power come right to you. Just close your eyes. Stay right in his presence. Every time you open your eyes, you let the Holy Spirit leak out. Let the power of God just go right through you. Let it go right through you. Right through you. Fire! In Jesus' name. Fire! In Jesus' name. Fire! In Jesus' name. Let it go right through you. Right through you. In Jesus' name. Fire! In Jesus' name. Fire! Fire! Let it go right through you. Right through you. Right through you. In Jesus' name. Lift your hands. Receive. Come on. Lift your hands and receive. Congregation, lift your hands. Just take one more drink for the road. Hallelujah. One more drink for the road. Fire! In Jesus' name. Fire! In Jesus' name. Fire! In Jesus' name. Fire! (sighs) Let it go right through you. In Jesus' name. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. Fire! In Jesus' name. Fire! In Jesus' name. Just keep drinking now. Keep drinking. Let the Holy Spirit touch you. As soon as you get desperate enough, as soon as you cry out to God, He's going to touch you. Fire! 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 Let His power go right through you now. Let it go right through you. Let it go right through you. See, it's not in the falling. It's in the receiving. You can receive standing up. You can receive right there in your seat. But you just got to keep drinking in God's presence. Lord, touch everybody watching on the webcast right now. Touch everybody here. Don't let anybody leave thirsty. Let them stay till they're full. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to make plans first week of July to be in those meetings. You can drink from those wells of our fathers, the wells that birthed the revivals we now enjoy and live in that impacted the world. Be ready for it. Monday through Friday, be ready for it. Those of you that have to go, feel free to be dismissed. Go get your children, but please be very quiet. Anybody that just wants more of God, just come up and get in line. Anybody that wants more of God, just come up and get in line. Go get your kids. Bring them back in. We'll pray for them. In Jesus' name, we'll see you tonight. (sighs) Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, touch the children. Never let our children grow up without knowing your presence, your power, your love, your anointing. 
Let every child in this house